Welcome to Grace on this wonderful day that the Lord has made for us to rejoice in. Pastor John Cherney will be preaching this morning on the treasure of the kingdom as we continue in our series in the Gospel of Matthew. So I invite you to trust in the goodness of God, casting off your every anxiety, and enjoy bringing his kingdom to earth. I'll join you at the end of the service for a few wrap-up items. This is Grace Alive from Grace Presbyterian Church in Peoria, Illinois. Please join with us as we worship God and study His Word together. Good morning, church family. Let us stand as God's word calls us to worship. Let us hear and respond from this call to worship from Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Amen. Let us rejoice.
Amen. We rejoice in the Lord, for he is good and trustworthy. He is not deceitful, and nor does he neglect us. And it is because he is so faithful to us that Scripture invites us to trust. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then Peter instructs us that we should be casting all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. In view of God's care, we should give him every grief and worry. However, we often do not trust his care and instead look to our own hands for rescue. Brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Let us look to Jesus and find his sacrifice sufficient for our trust in him. with your unending supply. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, strong defender of my weary heart, my sword to fight the cruel deceiver, and he will lose, and my shield against his hateful darts. My song when enemies surround me. My hope when tides of sorrow rise. My joy when trials are abounding. Your faithfulness my refuge in the night. Oh, we take refuge in you. Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, gracious Savior of my ruined life. My guilt and cross laid on your shoulders. In my place, you suffered, bled, and died. You rose, the grave and death are conquered forever and ever. You broke my bonds of sin and shame.
Isaiah 61 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels.
Father, please help us know in our bones that you're good. That we have no good reason to be anxious. Because you are powerful and you love us. So please today, God, teach us the fear of you and the love you have for us. And that we would know you not as we think you are, but as you know yourself to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Indeed, the Lord is good. Uh, there are many times when the musical portion of our worship service just brings me to tears when I think of what the Lord has done and how good he is and uh, why I'm allowed to be part of his family. But it is good to be with everybody. Good to worship here this morning, isn't it? Good to be good together. A couple of things uh, announcement-wise. It's time to check in if you haven't done that already. Do so on your phone or use the tear-off card. Either one uh, is acceptable. However, somebody pointed out to me the other day that if you use the tear-off paper, somebody has to punch that into the computer tomorrow morning. And if you do it on your phone, then they don't have to, and they can be doing something more productive with their time. Just a thought, okay? Uh, visitors, if you're a first-time visitor here, please, if you haven't already, stop out to the Welcome Center, which is right out by the front doors. It's that desk that's right by the main front doors. Uh, we've got a gift for you. We also just want to get acquainted. Uh, see how we can serve you. Oh, hey, somebody just pointed out, Abby Keel is here, and she's going to be in the, uh, I believe it's across there in, the, in that room over there, across from the, the sanctuary here. And she's going to be doing a, a meet and greet as well as a short presentation of what they've been up to. And if you're an old timer, Abby Keel and her husband Jason, you know those names. If you, <laughs> if you uh, are not so new, they've been involved in ministry for many years, and they're in a college ministry with crew right now down in Georgia. And you need to check that out. Um, they're, they're great people. And this morning we will also be praying for uh, Abby's parents, uh, Mike and Kathy Uno. So that's where the family thing comes in. So we'll be praying for them in just a moment here. Um, yeah, let us go to prayer now. Oh, Father, we do love you, and Lord, you are good. You are so good. Thank you for saving our unworthy souls and sending your son to make that possible. Lord, speaking of the keels, we want to pray for Mike and Kathy Uno. And all the, we just want to thank you for the many decades of service that they've given the body of Christ all over the world in, in many places uh, not so friendly to Christianity. We want to pray for uh, the ESL ministry that they're uh, heading up here at this church now. And Lord, I ask you that you would um, just have your way with them. Lord, that uh, you would help them to finish their race very strong and that uh, they would have many years yet of good service to you and help us to support them in the way we should as, as uh, their church. We love you and we honor you. Lord, we also pray for Bill and Jackie, Bill and Jackie Wright of PowerQuest. Lord, I just read of some of the uh, things they're doing in hospitals and how that's been successful. Um, Lord, they want to glorify you in what they do. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, you would continue to use them and that the modifications and additions to hospitals that they're doing would work well and that your name would be glorified in all that they do. We love you and we honor you, Lord, and we commit the rest of our worship service to you for your glorification, our audience today. In Jesus' name, amen.
this is my portion, a constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches. I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches. Should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When I know that Jesus is my portion. Dark transition, I guess. <laughs> I did not get the memo for that. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for singing that. I requested uh, that hymn that his eye is on the sparrow. Uh, it's one of my favorite hymns. Um, I've never heard it that way. That was lovely. I, I frequently think about that hymn in my backyard as we have bird feeders, and there's often little sparrows that come out. And the passage we're going to be looking at together this morning. Uh, is what that hymn is based off of. So if you guys want to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be picking up in verse 19 this morning and resuming our series in the study of the Gospel of Matthew. As you guys are turning there, as I was preparing for this sermon, it reminded me of an assignment I had in seminary. And the assignment got everybody in the class kind of worked up and a little bit worried. 
The professor didn't give a lot of directions for this particular assignment. It was only barely mentioned in the syllabus, and then came the day that he actually explained what the assignment was going to be, and it was one question. You got a single piece of paper, either handwritten or typed. You could go as small of a typeface as you wanted, as long as it could be read. And people began asking a lot of different questions on how are they going to do this assignment well. It was a good portion of our grade in the class, and they were, everybody was a little bit worried. The question was, what is the intention of Jesus? And for the assignment, you were allowed to use nothing other than the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and to just answer the question, who is Jesus? Why did he come? What is his intention? And someone asked the professor, a good friend of mine, well, how do we prepare for a paper like this? And the professor said, well, you're going to read, and you're going to read again, and maybe you'll even try to read all four Gospels in one sitting. You're going to think about it, and you've got a month to do this. And the thing that I found so startling with this assignment, the intention of Jesus, was one, I had never taken a step back and really observed the Gospels in that way. But it became so evident and so clear that Jesus comes as the king proclaiming a kingdom. And that throughout a lot of his teachings, he's telling us more and more about his kingdom. And in Matthew chapter 6 that we're going to read here in a moment, we're going to see that this kingdom is not just spiritual, but this kingdom even includes all of the realities of life. Even things like money. Jesus is not just teaching his disciples and the crowds what they should do with money. These are the same questions that we are dealing with today even. Just like the people in the crowds that Jesus is talking to in Matthew chapter 6, they wanted things that money could get them access to. They needed things like clothing, food, and shelter. They also desired to provide better for their children. They also desired to be comfortable. And Jesus' kingdom impacts all of that. And this kingdom even includes, as we're going to read in our passage, anxious people, even as we just sang. People worried about the future, people stressed with the things of daily life. And while many today have proclaimed Generation Z and Millennials the most anxious generation in history, being anxious about the future is nothing new. Everyone has been anxious, has felt that in their bones. And Jesus' kingdom speaks to even anxiety. His kingdom speaks to those who feel overwhelmed by too much information. His kingdom promises something that this world and all of its distractions and comforts simply can't offer. And Jesus tells his disciples and the crowd more about his kingdom. And he tells them to seek first his kingdom. This is what we're going to focus on this morning. The outline for my sermon is we're going to be trying to answer one big question. How do we seek first the kingdom of God? And we're going to see Jesus give four different comparisons. They're going to let us know more about his kingdom and even more what it means to seek his kingdom first. So if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word, we're going to be reading in Matthew chapter 6, picking up in verse 19 through the end of the chapter. Hear now the holy and infallible word of God. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, and so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness! No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. 
They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord, and it's been given for our good. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, Lord, you are glorious and you are gracious. You are the only one who is self-sufficient, who is uncreated. You provide all that we have. All of the, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to you. All of the gold and the silver in this world belong to you. And Lord, today as we look at your word and we seek to understand more of who our king is, Jesus, and what his kingdom is like, Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear. Lord, that we would see and rejoice in the provision that you give, in the love and the care that you provide. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I mentioned it already, but it's striking as we read this passage, all of the comparisons that Jesus makes. He compares different types of treasure, earthly and heavenly. He compares eyes being either healthy or bad, masters either being loved or hated, and birds and lilies to man. For us to better understand this kingdom of God, we're going to look at each of these comparisons and find these four answers to this question of how do we seek first the kingdom of God? So first we have this comparison of treasures. One of the first things we notice is that things don't look too well for these earthly treasures. We have moth, rust, and thieves awaiting it. Both moss and, moth and rust are passive harms. They come over time and even from neglect. And when it comes to those things coming in, especially even the neglect, you know, when we get something new, perhaps when you get a new phone or a new computer, you kind of baby it a little bit more. Maybe if you were just cooking in the kitchen, you're gonna go wash your hands before you touch your computer, but then eventually that computer kind of becomes a little bit old and you might even have whatever you were cooking still on your fingers and they might just go to the keyboard anyway. Or maybe when you get a new car, maybe you're someone who will park farther away to avoid other cars. Maybe you'll avoid eating in your car. And then eventually a, a kid gets sick in the back seat. And that thing that you treasured is now not as shiny. You don't treasure it as much as you once did before. And it might even smell a little bit. Well, the same thing happens even too. We have these active harms mentioned there. So we have those passive ones, moth and rust, and we have this active harm that a thief might come, that anything we treasure could be taken in a moment. Maybe you're someone who likes to go to coffee shops, and when you first got that brand new computer, you would never consider leaving it out while you went to the bathroom, but now it's five or six years old, and you're going to run to the bathroom in the coffee shop, and so maybe you even turn to a stranger and go, hey, will you watch this for me for a minute? But the first day that you got it, you would have never done that because you would have been suspicious of an active harm that could come. Solomon's mentioned in our passage here, and Solomon was the richest king that Israel ever had. And Ecclesiastes that he writes at the end of his life, he spends a lot of time reflecting that, you know, he had a lot of books, he had a lot of gardens, he had more wealth than anyone else. This is what he says in chapter 5. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. There's this reality that no treasure 
can be taken with us. And people have tried, you know, you have things built like pyramids of, hey, I'm going to take these things with me. But when the final breath comes, nothing is actually taken with of things that were maybe treasured. You know, we even pass things on in things like inheritance and wills. But even those things, Solomon later in Ecclesiastes is even worried about going, who knows if the person that comes after me is going to be good or bad? Are they going to treasure the thing that I treasured? Here's this family heirloom and now I'm passing it on and they might not see it as treasure. All things end up coming empty in the end. All treasure finds harm, whether actively or passively. And this statement from Jesus seems pretty obvious that things are going to break. The thing that was once new and shiny eventually is going to get slow or used. It's going to rot. Maybe it'll be taken away or given away. So why do we want these things? This is the earthly childhood, or the, the, this teaching, this early childhood teaching, not earthly, early childhood teaching, where we try to teach our children thing, the difference between a need and a want. Daddy, I need ice cream. You don't need ice cream. You want ice cream. Here what Jesus is talking about is the things that we want. Later in our passages we even already read, where he's going to talk about our needs, our clothing, our drink, our food. But right now he's talking about our wants, the things that we treasure, the things that we don't need to survive but believe we are incomplete if we don't have them. Like when a small child says, I need ice cream. These things Jesus compares to treasures in heaven. While moth, rust, and thieves in time will destroy all earthly treasures, Jesus says, neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Neither passive or active harm can befall treasure stored in heaven. This comparison shows that there are things that are temporary and there are things that are eternal. Things that can be destroyed and things that cannot be destroyed. Things that can be stolen and things that are protected in a way that none of us could buy a safe strong enough to protect these things. So what is Jesus hoping people would do with their treasure? Jesus is calling for a reality check here. What is truly important? For example, if you knew that something was a surefire investment, if you knew that investing in a stock today promised you riches tomorrow, wouldn't you invest? Or if somehow you knew the winning lottery numbers, wouldn't you purchase the ticket? Why would everyone in the crowd desire wealth? Why would all of us invest in that stock or go buy that lottery ticket? Because we believe it would bring us comfort. We believe that whatever could come in life, that we would be able to navigate it simply if we had enough money. We confuse that money grants freedom. We believe that we could protect ourselves and the others we care about from harm if simply there was enough zeros in our bank account. And ultimately, the, ends, the end of this ends up being that we believe that we could be like God. God who is alone self-sufficient. Self-sufficient, that he can provide all that he needs in himself. None of us can do that unless you can create air and water and food from yourself. That's part of the reality check. None of us are self-sufficient. But we think we can buy it. We think we can buy autonomy. We think we can buy the ability to navigate anything that can come up in our life. We desire to be self-sufficient. We desire to be the solution to all of the problems in our lives. Some of the crowd and some of us even believe that then we don't have a need for God if we can simply just provide the solution. And if you look back with me at verse 21, here's what Jesus says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what are you valuing? It seems to be an unwise investment to leave your wealth to the possible theft or destruction that's going to come to things. And the truth is that there is never enough treasure. The stock market, cryptocurrency, housing, it all will forever have its ups and downs. They cannot truly give you security. So do you want to know where your treasure is? You see what Jesus is saying here? Do you want to know what kingdom you're seeking? 
Jesus says it's on display what kingdom you're seeking, what king you are serving. It's on display by your dollars and cents. Your bank account displays what is truly valuable to you. Your credit card statement, your Amazon purchase history is a snapshot of your heart. And I don't think many of us would want to throw that up on the projector and be like, okay, here's my heart. Here's my Amazon history. Perhaps you're someone just considering the teachings of Jesus. And for some of this, you're like, wow, this sounds upside down. And it's true. The kingdom of Jesus is upside down. The first are last and the last are first. But when it comes to these things that we treasure, that we find value in, that we find our identity in, don't we often feel like they can be destroyed? That if we neglect it, somehow it just rots away from under us? That it could be stolen away in a moment, that something could change everything? Our hearts can't be satisfied in these things. We'll always need something else to satisfy us more. Your heart is not safe under your own security. You cannot protect it. So how do we seek first the kingdom of God? Here's the first answer to that question. We live in light of eternity, not for temporary gain. When Jesus says, don't lay up treasures, he does not forbid joyful living or financial planning. He forbids greed and the love of money that ends up being idolatry. It ends up distorting us that we think we can do everything on our own. He is truly an unhappy man who lays up his treasures on earth because his happiness is always uncertain and very short in duration. The only safe investment is the kingdom of God. It's the only treasure, the only place a treasure can be where it has a guaranteed result. It is the only surefire investment. When we store up our treasures in heaven, This means we're gonna invest our our lives and even the resources that we have, and it's gonna bear dividends for eternity when it's under the right king. And it's not me and it's not one of us in this room, but only King Jesus. I mentioned Solomon before, his reflections in Ecclesiastes. This is what he says in chapter five, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity, meaningless, empty. It's never gonna be enough. But let's go on to Jesus's next comparison because we wanna better understand what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? Look back with me at verses 22 through 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now this becomes one of the places where you're like, I need to chew on that. What's happening? We got a lamp, we got an eye, we got one that's good, one that's bad. What's Jesus talking about? Did he he change subjects? What's going on? So let's break it down. The eye is the lamp of the body. And the the eye is treated similar to the heart throughout the Bible. The eye is actually going to be like a lamp. It reveals the qualities of a person's inner life. It's showing the things that you care about. So a healthy eye means that the whole body is full of light. This one small thing being healthy provides something to the whole. Whereas a bad eye leaves the whole body full of darkness. This one small thing being bad hinders the whole. A little corruption corrupts entirely. So what is this bad vision like? An unhealthy eye cannot see what it should see. Everything is distorted and unclear. And if our objective is off, it cannot bring a good result. If you needed to drive 100 miles today and you were gonna have to drive with a compass, challenging, I know, And if I said you need to drive 100 miles true north and you're off by 10 degrees, when you get to the end of that 100 miles, you're gonna be pretty far off. I didn't actually do the math and I'm not gonna do the math on the fly, but you'd be pretty far off from your actual destination. If we have bad or unhealthy eyes, we frequently say things like, well, if I could just have blank 
first. Then I could care about Jesus' kingdom. Maybe when I am older, I'll consider who Jesus is. Maybe once my career is more established, I'll live for the kingdom and maybe share my faith with my coworkers. Once I'm a little bit more comfortable, then I could live for the kingdom because I already took care of me first and somebody's got to take care of me. So what then is this healthy eye? Well, it's full of light. It sees the things that are important. And here Jesus is saying how important his kingdom is. A healthy eye, clear vision, suggests kingdom vision, while a bad eye, being impaired, suggests a selfish vision. Who's gonna take care of me? Turned inward versus I'm actually looking out. So what your eyes long for is going to display what your true intentions of your heart is. And there's a lot of things that our hearts can long for. There's ads just about anywhere trying to create want. And people are good at it. So suddenly the shoes that you had aren't good enough, the clothes that you had aren't good enough, the car that you drive is too old, your phone needs yet another camera on the back. Eventually they're gonna have to stop or there's not gonna be a back of your phone, it's just gonna be all cameras. But suddenly these new and shiny things create this want and it's revealing if you have a healthy or unhealthy eye. So how do we seek first this kingdom of God? Well, we need to see with healthy eyes. We need kingdom vision. You cannot have kingdom intentions if you don't know the king and his kingdom. So where are your eyes fixed? Where is actually the intention of your heart? What are you focused on? Well, you and I aren't gonna be focused on anything other than ourselves if we're just worried about our own comfort, our own treasures being built up here. It's not gonna happen by accident. In the same way that if you were hosting a party at your house and you were only worried about your own comfort, your guests are going to suffer. You're gonna to forget to tell them where the bathroom is. You're gonna to forget to put out snacks and just eat food on yourself, by yourself. It would seem kind of ridiculous to go make yourself a cup of coffee if there was people in your house and you're only focused on your own comfort. So it's gonna take some shifting there. But we need to know what this kingdom of Jesus is about to see with healthy eyes. And for that, our weak eyes, we're gonna need the spectacles of scripture so that we could see clearly. We're gonna to need to know more and more who our king is and what his kingdom is about. Well, we've seen that to seek first the kingdom of God, we need to live for eternity, that we need to see with healthy eyes. Now let's go on to this next comparison because we still wanna understand this question better. When Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, how do we do it? What is it? What is it like? If you look back at verse 24 with me, here we read, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. There will be a loyalty to one that the other doesn't have. In the same way that if you were working two jobs and both employers made a request at the same time on the same day, one is going to win out. When your attention is divided, something wins. The end result will be, you're gonna love one and hate the other. You're gonna be devoted to one employer and despise the other by neglecting it. Two cannot be served with the same devotion. One will always lose. And oftentimes I think this is one of the spots for, for myself and probably for many of us where we think we're the exception to the rule. Where it's like, oh, surely I can handle that because I know myself well enough. So let, let me bring the absurdity that Jesus is comparing here to farther light for us. Can a Packers fan love the Bears? No. Can you scuba dive in the clouds? No. Can you serve, can you work at your company and also moonlight working for their number one competitor? If you work at Cat, can you work at John Deere on the weekends? No. Do armies allow for you to fight on both sides of the conflict? You know, it seems like there's a conflict of interest there. It doesn't seem like that's going to go well. In the same way that a great ship can't have two captains 
and a good kitchen can't have two chefs. Something is going to win out. And Jesus is very direct. In all of this teaching, he's talking about this every common day thing that all of us have to interact with, money. And he says, you cannot serve both God and money. They're like competing masters. One is going to win your loyalty. One is going to win your heart. One is going to have and be the apple of your eye. So here, I feel like it's going to be helpful for us to just zoom out a little bit. Just as a whole, you know, what, what does Scripture teach about money? And as I say that, some of you might even be thinking, you know, Pastor John, what do you know about money? Uh, I know very little. Uh, I am frequently extremely thankful that my wife is a bookkeeper. Uh, it keeps me out of tax fraud. It keeps our bills paid. It keeps our lights on. Um, it is truly wonderful for me. So you don't want to come to me for financial advice. But you do want to go to God for financial advice. And in Proverbs chapter 6, it reads, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Scripture encourages us to work hard like an ant, to not be a sluggard, to not be lazy, because if not, poverty is going to come to you. Or consider in Genesis 41, Joseph, when he goes to interpret Pharaoh's dream, it ends up leading to the saving of things during a famine, being prepared for a possible day of disaster. Scripture doesn't say savings are bad. In 2 Corinthians 12, 14, this is what Paul says to the church, for children are not obligated to save for their parents, but parents for their children. So if you're a parent in the room, you have an obligation to prepare and save for the future of your children. But that's not your child's responsibility to save and take care of you. Or James chapter 5. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. You're required to pay your debts and not to pursue luxury or self-indulgence. Or in 2 Thessalonians, Paul says it very pointedly, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. You have to work to have money. You need to be like an ant in the field. And you need to pay your laborers as well. Jesus commands, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Paul warns Timothy even that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And it's because all of these things can be twisted and distorted. Like an unhealthy eye. Like trying to serve two masters. Like trying to build up two separate treasure chests. This is the reality. We, we must work. We must pay taxes. We should provide for ourselves, save for our children. We should pay our debts. We should pay those who work for us. We should save for the future even. But there's also the warning of what money can do, that all sorts of evils and distortions can come. We must not believe ourselves to be the exception, saying, others might struggle but not me. I can handle it. So in the same way that what we treasure shows our hearts, what we long for reveals our intention, and we cannot serve two masters. The kingship of Jesus is not shared. He alone is Lord, and money cannot have mastery over you. You cannot serve both God and money. Money is a tool given, and the improper use of it does not negate the proper use of it. But we're to use it properly, or to even to use it for the kingdom. As Paul writes in his second letter to the church of Corinth, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. God has made us rich in every way by what his son has done for us. 
We're to be a generous people. It's to actually change the way that we live and interact with one another. So what do we learn about seeking the kingdom of God first from this comparison of the masters and the survey of what does the Bible teach about money in a very small nutshell? Well, you are to serve your master and not allow something else to take the throne that belongs to Jesus alone. But let's go on to the last comparison that Jesus makes. And here is a, a bomb to our souls. Here is a, a Band-Aid because so often we feel so anxious and worried. Because if we're going to seek first his kingdom, a natural response is to feel unsure because who's going to take care of me becomes one of the questions. Look back with me at verse 25. Here Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing. Here we've shifted from the wants to the needs. And Jesus is saying, therefore, these things go together. In light of these things that I have just said, it's this honest question, who's going to worry about me? And this does not remove all of our care. God even wants us to care, as I just read through different passages in Scripture. Here is the point. You will be anxious if you improperly value the temporary things. If your eye is bad, if you try to serve two masters, if you try to build up two treasures, here is this common and everyday example that Jesus gives. Look back at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Really listen to this question that Jesus asks. Are you not of more value than they? Are you not more valuable than the birds? And God provides for them in every way. God cares for them in every way. Are you not of more value? Your father knows what you need. And like a good father, he provides what is needed. And that might even mean him providing you good labor to do, good work to do. But worry is not going to add a single hour to your life. Look back, uh, picking up in verse 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? O you of little faith, do you believe that your father is good? You know, it's wonderful that we're in, in springtime right now with, with this passage because the birds are coming back. Flowers are starting to bud. And here are these beautiful reminders of a God who loves you so much that he loves you more than those things. The flowers coming back, the birds singing in your garden. And each time you see a bird, each time you see a flower blooming, remember that, hey, that flower might be pretty. It's even prettier than Solomon in all of his glory. And that bird, its needs are taken care of by the God who made it. And how much more does he care for you? Verse 32, Jesus says, For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. And so here when it's talking about Gentiles, Gentiles can also be translated the, the nations, or in our context here, I'm going to go ahead and call it non-kingdom people. Seek after these things. People who are not about the kingdom seek after all of these things, thinking they have to provide for themselves. In a way, they're like orphans because they don't believe they have a father who cares for them the way that he even cares for the bird and for the lily. And can I just say that if you feel like an orphan, if you feel like you have to care for and provide for all of your own needs, you have every reason to be anxious. But the grace of God is that his son has come to make you a child, to bring you in. And if you want to know more about this heavenly father who holds outstretched arms and calls you home through his son, King Jesus, who provides for you in every way, who cares about you, I'd love to talk more. The pastors will be down at the front at the end. 
because there's no more important thing and that anxiety that must feel crippling, feeling like you're an orphan, that there's nobody that cares about you. God cares about you. And every time you see a bird or a flower, it's even testifying to his care for you, even as he upholds the world that he has made. This is the final answer to our question, how do we seek first the kingdom of God? We remember our Father's care and provision. We're not alone. We're not orphans. We're not solving everything on our own. This is the treasure of the kingdom, that a God who loves us so much has made a way for us to be his children. If the thing you're striving after is anything other than God's kingdom, it's gonna impact all of your life. And Jesus is right, the first thought becomes anxiety producing. Do you feel anxious? Are you trusting him? Do you believe that he is a good and loving father? This is what it means to seek first the kingdom of God, is to even begin by recognizing that he is a father who loves and upholds everything. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, Lord, we do so often forget the love and care that you have for us, the many ways that you provide for us, Lord, I do pray that even this spring that the small reminders of birds and flowers would testify to us, little reminders of your love and care. Lord, that we would cast all of our anxieties upon your son because you care for us, that that love would become more and more evident. Lord, even as we, we stumble and trip at times and bear with one another's burdens, that we might seek first the kingdom of your son for all of eternity. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen stand and cast ourselves to the God who cares for us. Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee
God is, God is truly our Father who gives refuge to our weary souls. Hear now this benediction from Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. May go in peace. Pastors will be available here in the front if you'd like to chat. Thank you for joining us this morning as we strive to lay up treasures in heaven and not on earth. As always, know that any gift that you give helps to keep this live streaming service available to so many friends. We would love to hear from you on how we can pray for you or how this service has been a blessing to you. You can write to us at Grace Alive, P.O. Box 9272, Peoria, Illinois, 61612, or you can email us at gracealive at gracepress.org. Join me now in prayer. Father, as we see the strange weather that we have experienced and a restart to spring, Father, we pray for even a refreshment of our own heart and perhaps a restart on some of the spiritual disciplines and some of the commitments, and perhaps we've got a little bit off in some of our priorities. So, Father, we seek to realign ourselves with your perfect work in our lives. We pray that you would continue to shower your grace upon us and that we truly would be a blessing to those you've put in our path this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.